The Decline of the West by Oswald Spengler, Volume 1, Form and Actuality. Chapter 1, Introduction. Part 3. Considered in itself, the Roman world dominion was a negative phenomenon, being the result not of a surplus of energy on the one side, that the Romans had never had since Zama, but of a deficiency of resistance on the other. That the Romans did not conquer the world is certain. They merely took possession of a booty that lay open to everyone. The Imperium Romanum came into existence not as the result of such an extremity of military and financial effort as had characterized the Punic Wars, but because the Old East forewent all external self-determinations. We must not be deluded by the appearance of brilliant military success. With a few ill-trained, ill-led, and sullen legions, Lucullus and Pompey conquered whole realms, a phenomenon that in the period of the Battle of Ipsus would have been unthinkable. The Mithridatic danger, serious enough for a system of material force which had never been put to any real test, would have been nothing to the conquerors of Hannibal. After Zama, the Romans never again either waged or were capable of waging a war against a great military power. Their classic wars were those against the Samnites, Pyrrhus, and Carthage. Their grand hour was Cannae. To maintain the heroic posture for centuries on end is beyond the power of any people. The Prussian-German people have had three great moments, 1813, 1870, and 1914, and that is more than others have had. Here, then, I lay it down that imperialism, of which petrifacts such as the Egyptian Empire, the Roman, the Chinese, the Indian, may continue to exist for hundreds or thousands of years. Dead bodies, amorphous and dispirited masses of men, scrap material from a great history, is to be taken as the typical symbol of the passing away. Imperialism is civilization unadulterated. In this phenomenal form, the destiny of the West is now irrevocably set. The energy of culture man is directed inwards, that of civilization man outwards. And thus I see in Cecil Rhodes the first man of a new age. He stands for the political style of a far-ranging Western, Teutonic, and especially German future. And his phrase, expansion is everything, is the Napoleonic reassertion of the indwelling tendency of every civilization that has fully ripened, Roman, Arab, or Chinese. It is not a matter of choice. It is not the conscious will of individuals, or even that of whole classes or peoples that decides. The expansive tendency is a doom, something demonic and immense, which grips, forces into service, and uses up the late mankind of the world city stage, willy-nilly, aware or unaware. Life is the process of affecting possibilities, and for the brain man there are only extensive possibilities. Hard as the half-developed socialism of today is fighting against expansion, one day it will become arc-expansionist with all the vehemence of destiny. Here, the form language of politics, as the direct intellectual expression of a certain type of humanity, touches on a deep metaphysical problem, on the fact, affirmed in the grant of unconditional validity to the causality principle, that the soul is the complement of its extension. When, between 480 and 230, the Chinese group of states was tending towards imperialism, it was entirely futile to combat the principle of imperialism, Lain Hing, practiced in particular by the Roman state of Sin, and theoretically represented by the philosopher Shang Yi, by the ideas of a League of Nations, Ho Tsung, largely derived from Wang Hu. A profound skeptic who had no illusions as to the men or the political possibilities of this late period. Both sides opposed the anti-political idealism of Lao Tzu, but as between themselves it was Lin Heng and not Ho Tsung which swam with the natural current of expansive civilization. Rhodes is to be regarded as the first precursor of a western type of Caesars, whose day is to come though yet distant. He stands midway between Napoleon and the force men of the next centuries, just as Flaminius, who from 232 BC onward, pressed the Romans to undertake the subjugation of Cisalpine Gaul, and so initiated the policy of colonial expansion, stands between Alexander and Caesar. Strictly speaking, Flaminius was a private person, 
for his real power was not of a kind not embodied in any constitutional office, who exercised a dominant influence in the state at a time when the state idea was giving way to pressure of economic factors. So far as Rome is concerned, he was the archetype of opposition to Caesarism. With him there came an end to the idea of state service, and there began the will to power, which ignored traditions and reckoned only with forces. Alexander and Napoleon were romantics. Though they stood on the threshold of civilization, and in its cold, clear air, the one fancied himself an Achilles, and the other read Werther. Caesar, on the contrary, was a pure man of fact, gifted with immense understanding. But even for Rhodes, political success means territorial and financial success, and only that. Of this Romanness within himself he is fully aware, but Western civilization has not yet taken shape in such strength and purity as this. It was only before his maps that he could fall into a sort of poetic trance. This son of the personage who, sent out to South Africa without means, made a gigantic fortune and employed it as the engine of his political aims. His idea of a trans-African railway from the Cape to Cairo, his project of a South African empire, his intellectual hold on the hard metal soles of the mining magnates, whose wealth he forced into the service of his schemes, his capital Bulawayo, royally planned as a future residence by a statesman who was all-powerful yet stood in no definite relation to the state, his wars, his diplomatic deals, his road systems, his syndicates, his armies, his conception of the great duty to civilization of the man of brain. All this, broad and imposing, is the prelude of a future which is still in store for us, and with which the history of West European mankind will be definitely closed. He who does not understand that this outcome is obligatory and insusceptible to modification, that our choice is between willing this and willing nothing at all, between cleaving to this destiny or despairing of the future and of life itself, he who cannot feel that there is grandeur also in the realizations of powerful intelligences, in the energy and discipline of metal-hard natures, in battles fought with the coldest and most abstract means, he who is obsessed with the idealism of a provincial, and would pursue the ways of life of past ages, must forego all desires to comprehend history, to live through history, or to make history. Thus regarded, the Imperium Romanum appears no longer as an isolated phenomenon, but as the normal product of a strict and energetic, megalopolitan, predominantly practical spirituality, as typical of a final and irreversible condition, which has occurred often enough, though it has only been identified as such in this instance. Let it be realized, then, that the secret of historical form does not lie on the surface, that it cannot be grasped by means of similarities of costume and setting, and that in the history of men, as in that of animals and plants, there occur phenomena showing deceptive similarity but inwardly without any connection. E.g. Charlemagne and Harun al-Rashid, Alexander and Caesar, the German wars upon Rome, and the Mongol onslaughts upon West Europe, and other phenomena of extreme outward dissimilarity but of identical import e.g. the Trajan and Ramesses II, the Bourbons and the Attic Demos, Muhammad and Pythagoras, that the 19th and 20th centuries, hitherto looked on as the highest point of an ascending straight line of world history, are in reality a stage of life which may be observed in every culture that has ripened to its limit. A stage of life characterized not by socialist, impressionist, electric railways, torpedoes, and differential equations, for these are only body constituents of the time, but by a civilized spirituality which possesses not only these but also quite other creative possibilities. That, as our own time represents a transitional phase which occurs with certainty under particular conditions, there are perfectly well-defined states, such as have occurred more than once in the history of the past, later than the present-day state of West Europe, and therefore that the future of the West is not a limitless tending upwards and onwards for all time towards our present ideals, but a single phenomenon of history, strictly limited and defined as to form and duration, which covers a few centuries and can be viewed and, in essentials, calculated from available precedents. This high plane of contemplation, once attained, the rest is easy. 
To this single idea one can refer, and by it one can solve, without straining or forcing, all those separate problems of religion, art history, epistemology, ethics, politics, and economics, with which the modern intellect has so passionately and so vainly busied itself for decades. This idea is one of those truths that have only to be expressed with full clarity to become indisputable. It is one of the inward necessities of the Western culture and of its world feeling. It is capable of entirely transforming the world outlook of one who fully understands it, i.e. makes it intimately his own. It immensely deepens the world picture natural and necessary to us in that, already trained to regard world historical evolution as an organic unit seen backwards from our standpoint in the present, we are enabled by its aid to follow the broad lines into the future a privilege of dream calculation till now permitted only to the physicist. It is, I repeat, in effect, the substitution of a Copernican for a Ptolemaic aspect of history, that is, an immeasurable widening of horizon. Up to now, everyone has been at liberty to hope what he pleased about the future, where there are no facts, sentiment rules, but henceforward it will be every man's business to inform himself of what can happen, and therefore of what with the unalterable necessity of destiny, and irrespective of personal ideals, hopes, or desires, will happen. When we use the risky word freedom, we shall mean freedom to do, not this or that, but the necessary or nothing. The feeling that this is just as it should be is the hallmark of the man of fact. To lament it and blame it is not to alter it. To birth belongs death, to youth age, to life generally its form and its allotted span. The present is a civilized, emphatically not a cultured time, and ipso facto a great number of life capacities fall out as impossible. This may be deplorable, and may be and will be deplored in pessimist philosophy and poetry, but it is not in our power to make it otherwise. It will not be, already it is not, permissible to defy clear historical experience and to expect, merely because we hope, that this will spring or that will flourish. It will no doubt be objected that such a world outlook, which in giving this certainty as to the outlines and tendency of the future, cuts off all far-reaching hopes, would be unhealthy for all and fatal for many. Once it ceased to be a mere theory and was adopted as a practical scheme of life by the group of personalities effectively molding the future. Such is not my opinion. We are civilized, not gothic or rococo people. We have to reckon with the cold hard facts of late life, to which the parallel is to be found not in Pericles' Athens, but in Caesar's Rome. Of great painting or great music, there can no longer be, for Western people, any question. Their architectural possibilities have been exhausted these hundred years. Only extensive possibilities are left to them. Yet, for a sound and vigorous generation that is filled with unlimited hopes, I fail to see that it is any disadvantage to discover by times that some of these hopes must come to nothing. And if the hopes thus doomed should be most dear, well, a man who is worth anything will not be dismayed. It is true that the issue may be a tragic one for some individuals who in their decisive years are overpowered by the conviction that in the spheres of architecture, drama, painting, there is nothing left for them to conquer. What matters if they do go under? It has been the convention hitherto to admit no limits of any sort in these matters, and to believe that each period has had its own task to do in each sphere. Tasks, therefore, were found by hook or by crook, leaving it to be settled posthumously whether or not the artist's faith was justified and his life work necessary. Now, nobody but a pure romantic would take this way out. Such a pride is not the pride of a Roman. What are we to think of the individual who, standing before an exhausted quarry, would rather be told that a new vein will be struck tomorrow, the bait offered by the radically false and mannerized art of the moment, than be shown a rich and virgin clay bed nearby? The lesson, I think, would be of benefit to the coming generations, as showing them what is possible, and therefore necessary, and what is excluded from the inward potentialities of their time. Hitherto, an incredible total of intellect and power has been squandered in false directions. The West European, however historically he may think and feel, is at a certain stage of life invariably uncertain of his own direction.
He gropes and feels his way, and, if unlucky in environment, he loses it. But now at last the work of centuries enables him to view the disposition of his own life in relation to the general culture scheme, and to test his own powers and purposes. And I can only hope that men of the new generation may be moved by this book to devote themselves to technics instead of lyrics, the sea instead of paintbrush, and politics instead of epistemology. Better they could not do. It still remains to consider the relation of a morphology of world history to philosophy. All genuine historical work is philosophy, unless it is mere ant industry. But the operations of the systematic philosopher are subject to constant and serious error through his assuming the permanence of his results. He overlooks the fact that every thought lives in a historical world and is therefore involved in the common destiny of mortality. He supposes that higher thought possesses an everlasting and unalterable objectiveness, Gegenstand, that the great questions of all epochs are identical, and that, therefore, they are capable in the last analysis of unique answers. But the question and answer are here one, and the great questions are made great by the very fact that unequivocal answers to them are so passionately demanded, so that it is as life symbols only that they possess significance. There are no eternal truths. Every philosophy is the expression of its own, and only its own, time. And, if by philosophy we mean effective philosophy, and not academic triflings about judgment forms, sense categories, and the like, no two ages possess the same philosophic intentions. The difference is not between perishable and imperishable doctrines, but between doctrines which live their day and doctrines which never live at all. The immortality of thoughts become is an illusion. The essential is, what kind of man comes to expression in them? The greater the man, the truer the philosophy, with the inward truth that in a great work of art transcends all proof of its several elements, or even of their compatibility with one another. At highest, the philosophy may absorb the entire content of an epoch, realize it within itself, and then, embodying it in some grand form or personality, pass it on to be developed further and further. The scientific dress, or the mark of learning adopted by a philosophy, is here unimportant. Nothing is simpler than to make good poverty of ideas by founding a system. And even a good idea has little value when enunciated by a solemn ass. Only its necessity to life decides the imminence of a doctrine. For me, therefore, the test of value to be applied to a thinker is his eye for the great facts of his own time. Only this can settle whether he is merely a clever architect of systems and principles, versed in definitions and analyses, or whether it is the very soul of his time that speaks in his works and his intuitions. A philosopher who cannot grasp and command actuality as well will never be of the first rank. The pre-Socratics were merchants and politicians in grand. The desire to put his political ideas into practice in Syracuse nearly cost Plato his life, and it was the same Plato who discovered the set of geometrical theorems that enabled Euclid to build up the classical system of mathematics. Pascal, whom Nietzsche knows only as the broken Christian, Descartes, Leibniz, were the first mathematicians and technicians of their time. The great pre-Socratics of China, from Quan Si, about 670, to Confucius, 550 to 478, were statesmen, regents, lawgivers like Pythagoras and Paramenides, like Hobbes and Leibniz, with Lao Tzu, the opponent of all state authority in high politics and the enthusiast of small peaceful communities, unworldliness and deed shyness first appear, heralds of lecture room and study philosophy. But Lao Tse was in his time the ancient regime of China, an exception in the midst of sturdy philosophers for whom epistemology meant the knowledge of the important relations of actual life. And herein, I think, all the philosophers of the newest age are open to a serious criticism. What they do not possess is a real standing in actual life. Not one of them has intervened effectively, either in higher politics, in the development of modern techniques, in matters of communication, in economics, or in any other big actuality, with a single act or a single compelling idea. Not one of them counts in mathematics, in physics, in the science of government, even to the extent that can't count it. Let us glance at other times. 
Confucius was several times a minister. Pythagoras was the organizer of an important political movement, akin to the Cromwellian, the significance of which is even now far underestimated by classical researchers. Goethe, besides being a model executive minister, though lacking, alas, the operative sphere of a great state, was interested in the Suez and Panama canals, the dates of which he foresaw with accuracy and their effects on the economy of the world, and he busied himself again and again with the question of American economic life and its reactions on the old world, and with that of the dawning of the new era of machine industry. Hobbes was one of the originators of the great plan of winning South America for England, and although in execution the plan went no further than the occupation of Jamaica, he has the glory of being one of the founders of the British colonial empire. Leibniz, without doubt the greatest intellect in Western philosophy, the founder of the differential calculus and the analysis situs, conceived or cooperated in a number of major political schemes, one of which was to relieve Germany by drawing the attention of Louis XIV to the importance importance of Egypt as a factor in French world policy. The ideas of the memorandum on this subject that he drew up for the Grand Monarch were so far in advance of their time, 1672, that it has been thought that Napoleon made use of them for his eastern venture. Even thus early, Leibniz laid down the principle that Napoleon grasped more and more clearly after Wagram, viz. that acquisitions on the Rhine and in Belgium would not permanently better the position of France, and that the neck of Suez would one day be the key of world dominance. Doubtless the king was not equal to these deep political and strategic conceptions of the philosopher. Turning from men of this mold to the philosophers of today, one is dismayed and shamed. How poor their personalities, how commonplace their political and practical outlook. Why is it that the mere idea of calling upon one of them to prove his intellectual eminence in government, diplomacy, large-scale organization, or direction of any big colonial, commercial, or transport concern is enough to evoke our pity? And this insufficiency indicates not that they possess inwardness, but simply that they lack weight. I look round in vain for an instance in which a modern philosopher has made a name by even one deep or far-seeing pronouncement on an important question of the day. I see nothing but provincial opinions of the same kind as anyone else's. Whenever I take up a work by a modern thinker, I find myself asking, has he any idea whatever of the actualities of world politics, world city problems, capitalism, the future of the state, the relation of technics to the course of civilization, Russia, science? Goethe would have understood all this and reveled in it, but there is not one living philosopher capable of taking it in. This sense of actualities is, of course, not the same thing as the content of a philosophy, but, I repeat, it is an infallible symptom of its inward necessity, its fruitfulness, and its symbolic importance. We must allow ourselves no illusions as to the gravity of this negative result. It is palpable that we have lost sight of the final significance of effective philosophy. We confuse philosophy with preaching, with agitation, with novel writing, with lecture room jargon. We have descended from the perspective of the bird to that of the frog. It has come to this, that the very possibility of a real philosophy of today and tomorrow is in question. If not, it were far better to become a colonist or an engineer, to do something, no matter what, that is true and real, than to chew over once more the old dried-up themes under cover of an alleged new wave of philosophic thought. Far better to construct an arrow engine than a new theory of apperception that is not wanted. Truly, it is a poor life's work to restate, once more, in slightly different terms, views of a hundred predecessors on the will, or on psychophysical parallelism. This may be a profession, but a philosophy it emphatically is not. A doctrine that does not attack and affect the life of the period in its inmost depths is no doctrine, and had better not be taught. And what was possible even yesterday is, today, at least not indispensable. To me, the depths and refinement of mathematical and physical theories are a joy. By comparison, the aesthete and the physiologist are fumblers. I would sooner have the fine, mind-begotten forms of a fast steamer, a steel structure, a precision lathe, the subtlety and elegance of many chemical and optical processes, than all the pickings and stealings of present-day arts and crafts, architecture and paintings included. I prefer one Roman aqueduct to all Roman temples and statues. I love the Colosseum and the giant vault of the Palatine, for they display for me today, in the brown massiveness of their brick construction, the real Rome and the grand practical sense of her engineers. 
But it is a matter of indifference to me whether the empty and pretentious marblery of Caesars, their rows of statuary, their friezes, their overloaded architraves, is preserved or not. Glance at some reconstruction of the imperial fora. Do we not find them the true counterpart of a modern international exhibition? obtrusive, bulky, empty, a boasting in materials and dimensions wholly alien to Periclean Greece and the Rococo alike, but exactly paralleled in the Egyptian modernism that is displayed in the rooms of Ramesses II, 1300 BC, at Luxor and Karnak? It was not for nothing that the genuine Roman despised the Graculus Histrio, the kind of artist and the kind of philosopher to be found on the soil of Roman civilization. The time for art and philosophy had passed. They were exhausted, used up, superfluous, and his instinct for the realities of life told him so. One Roman law weighed more than all the lyrics and school metaphysics of the time together. And I maintain that today many an inventor, many a diplomat, many a financier is a sounder philosopher than all those who practice the dull craft of experimental psychology. This is a situation which regularly repeats itself at a certain historical level. It would have been absurd in a Roman of intellectual eminence, who might as consul or praetor lead armies, organize provinces, build cities and roads, or even be the princeps in Rome, to want to hatch out some new variant of post-Platonic school philosophy at Athens or Rhodes. Consequently, no one did so. It was not in harmony with the tendency of the age, and therefore it only attracted third-class men of the kind that always advances as far as the zeitgeist of the day before yesterday. It is a very grave question whether this stage has or has not set in for us already. A century of purely extensive effectiveness, excluding big artistic and metaphysical production, let us say frankly an irreligious time which coincides exactly with the idea of the world city, is a time of decline. True, but we have not chosen this time. We cannot help it if we are born as men of the early winter of full civilization, instead of on the golden summit of a ripe culture, in a Phidias or a Mozart time. Everything depends on our seeing our own position, our destiny, clearly, on our realizing that though we may lie to ourselves about it, we cannot evade it. He who does not acknowledge this in his heart ceases to be counted among the men of his generation, and remains either a simpleton, a charlatan, or a pedant. Therefore, in approaching a problem of the present, one must begin by asking oneself, a question answered in advance by instinct in the case of the genuine adept, what today is possible and what he must forbid himself. Only a very few of the problems of metaphysics are, so to say, allocated for solution to any epoch of thought. Even thus soon, a whole world separates Nietzsche's time, in which a last trace of romanticism was still operative, from our own, which has shed every vestige of it. Systematic philosophy closes with the end of the 18th century. Kant put its utmost possibilities in forms both grand in themselves and, as a rule, final for the Western soul. He is followed, as Plato and Aristotle were followed, by a specifically megalopolitan philosophy that was not speculative but practical, irreligious, social-ethical. This philosophy, paralleled in the Chinese civilization by the schools of the Epicurean Yang Chu, the socialist Mo Ti, the pessimist Shuang Tzu, the positivist Mencius, and in the classical by the Cynics, the Cyrenaics, the Stoics, and the Epicureans, begins in the West with Schopenhauer, who is the first to make the will to life, creative life force, the center of gravity of his thought, although the deeper tendency of his doctrine is obscured by his having, under the influence of a great tradition, maintained the obsolete distinctions of phenomena and things in themselves and such like. It is the same creative will to life that was Schopenhauer-wise denied in Tristan, and Darwin-wise asserted in Siegfried, that was brilliantly and theatrically formulated by Nietzsche in The Zarathustra, that led the Hegelian Marx to an economic and the Malthusian Darwin to a biological hypothesis, which together have subtly transformed the world outlook of the Western megalopolis and that produced a homogeneous series of tragedy conceptions extending from Hebel's Judith to Ibsen's epilogue. It has embraced, therefore, all the possibilities of a true philosophy, and at the same time it has exhausted them. Systematic philosophy, then, lies immensely far behind us, and ethical has been wound up.
But a third possibility, corresponding to the classical skepticism, still remains to the soul world of the present-day West, and it can be brought to light by the hitherto unknown methods of historical morphology. That which is a possibility is a necessity. The classical skepticism is ahistoric. It doubts by denying outright. But that of the West, if it is an inward necessity, a symbol of the autumn of our spirituality, is obliged to be historical through and through. Its solutions are got by treating everything as relative, as a historical phenomenon, and its procedure as psychological. Whereas the skeptic of philosophy arose within Hellenism as the negation of philosophy, declaring philosophy to be purposeless, we, on the contrary, regard the history of philosophy as, a last resort, philosophy's gravest theme. This is skepsis, in the true sense, for whereas the Greek is led to renounce absolute standpoints by contempt of the intellectual past, we are led to do so by comprehension of that past as an organism. In this work it will be our task to sketch out this unphilosophical philosophy, the last that West Europe will know. Skepticism is the expression of a pure civilization, and it dissipates the world picture of the culture that has gone before. For us, its success will lie in resolving all the older problems into one, the genetic. Conviction that what is also has become, that the natural and cognizable is rooted in the historic, that the world as the actual is founded on an ego as the potential actualized, that the when and the how long hold as deep a secret as the what, leads directly to the fact that everything, whatever else it may be, must at any rate be the expression of something living. Cognitions and judgments, too, are acts of living men. The thinkers of the past conceived external actuality as produced by cognition and motiving ethical judgments, but to the thought of the future they are above all expressions and symbols. The morphology of world history becomes inevitably a universal symbolism. With that, the claim of higher thought to possess general and eternal truths falls to the ground. Truths are truths only in relation to a particular mankind. Thus, my own philosophy is able to express and reflect only the Western, as distinct from the classical, Indian, or other, soul, and that soul only in its present civilized phase by which its conception of the world, its practical range, and its sphere of effect are specified. In concluding this introduction, I may be permitted to add a personal note. In 1911, I proposed to myself to put together some broad considerations on the political phenomena of the day and their possible developments. At that time, the World War appeared to me both as imminent and also as the inevitable outward manifestation of the historical crisis, and my endeavor was to comprehend it from an examination of the spirit of the preceding centuries, not years. In the course of this originally small task, the conviction forced itself on me that for an effective understanding of the epoch, the area to be taken into the foundation plan must be very greatly enlarged, and that in an investigation of this sort, if the results were to be fundamentally conclusive and necessary results, it was impossible to restrict oneself to a single epoch and its political actualities, or to confine oneself to a pragmatical framework, or even to do without purely metaphysical and highly transcendental methods of treatment. It became evident that a political problem could not be comprehended by means of politics themselves, and that, frequently, important factors at work in the depths could only be grasped through their artistic manifestations or even distantly seen in the form of scientific or purely philosophical ideas. Even the politico-social analysis of the last decades of the 19th century, a period of tense quiet between two immense and outstanding events, the one which, expressed in the Revolution and Napoleon, had fixed the picture of West European actuality for a century, and another of at least equal significance that was visibly and ever more rapidly approaching, was found in the last resort to be impossible without bringing in all the great problems of being in all their aspects. For, in the historical as in the natural world picture, there is found nothing, however small, that does not embody in itself the entire sum of the fundamental tendencies. And thus, the original theme came to be immensely widened. A vast number of unexpected, and in the main entirely novel, questions and interrelations presented themselves. And finally, it became perfectly clear that no single fragment of history could be thoroughly illuminated unless and until the secret of world history itself, to wit the story of higher mankind as an organism of regular structure, had been cleared up. And hitherto this has not been done, even in the least degree. 
From this moment on, relations and connections, previously often suspected, sometimes touched on, but never comprehended, presented themselves in ever-increasing volume. The forms of the arts linked themselves to the forms of war and state policy. Deep relations were revealed between political and mathematical aspects of the same culture, between religious and technical conceptions, between mathematics, music, and sculpture, between economics and cognition forms. Clearly and unmistakably, there appeared the fundamental dependence of the most modern physical and chemical theories on the mythological concepts of our Germanic ancestors, the style congruence of tragedy and power techniques and up-to-date finance, and the fact, bizarre at first, but soon self-evident, that oil painting perspective, printing, the credit system, long-range weapons, and contrapuntal music in one case, and the nude statue, the city-state, and coin currency, discovered by the Greeks, in another, were identical expressions of one and the same spiritual principle. And beyond and above all, there stood out the fact that these great groups of morphological relations, each one of which symbolically represents a particular sort of mankind in the whole picture of world history, are strictly symmetrical in structure. It is this perspective that first opens out for us the true style of history. Belonging itself as a symbol and expression to one time, and therefore inwardly possible and necessary only for present-day Western man, it can but be compared, distantly, to certain ideas of ultra-modern mathematics in the domain of the theory of groups. These were thoughts that had occupied me for many years, though dark and undefined, until enabled by this method to emerge in tangible form. Thereafter, I saw the present, the approaching world war, in a quite other light. It was no longer a momentary constellation of casual facts due to national sentiments, personal influences, or economic tendencies endowed with an appearance of unity and necessity by some historian's scheme of political or social cause and effect, but the type of a historical change of phase occurring within a great historical organism of definable compass at the point preordained for it hundreds of years ago. The mark of the great crisis is its innumerable passionate questionings and probings. In our own case, there were books and ideas by the thousand, but scattered, disconnected, limited by the horizons of specialisms as they were, they incited, depressed, and confounded, but could not free. Hence, though these questions are seen, their identity is missed. Consider those art problems that, though never comprehended in their depths, were evidenced in the disputes between form and content, line and space, drawing and color, in the notion of style, and in the idea of impressionism and the music of Wagner. Consider the decline of art and the failing authority of science, the grave problems arising out of the victory of the megalopolis over the countryside, such as childlessness and land depopulation, the place in society of a fluctuating fourth estate, the crisis in materialism, in socialism, in parliamentary government, the position of the individual vis-a-vis -vis the state, the problem of private property with its pendant, the problem of marriage. Consider at the same time one fact taken from what is apparently an entirely different field, the voluminous work that was being done in the domain of folk psychology on the origins of myths, arts, religions, and thought, and done, moreover, no longer from an ideal but from a strictly morphological standpoint. It is my belief that every one of these questions was really aimed in the same direction as every other, viz. towards that one riddle of history that had never yet emerged with sufficient distinctness in the human consciousness. The tasks before men were not, as supposed, infinitely numerous. They were one and the same task. Everyone had an inkling that this was so, but no one from his own narrow standpoint had seen the single and comprehensive solution. And yet it had been in the air since Nietzsche, and Nietzsche himself had gripped all the decisive problems, although, being a romantic, he had not dared to look strict reality in the face. But herein precisely lies the inward necessity of the stock-taking doctrine, so to call it. It had to come, and it could only come at this time. Our skepticism is not an attack upon, but rather the verification of, our stock of thoughts and works. It confirms all that has been sought and achieved for generations past, in that it integrates all the truly living tendencies which it finds in the special spheres, no matter what their aim may be.
Above all, there discovered itself the opposition of history and nature through which alone it is possible to grasp the essence of the former. As I have already said, man as an element and representative of the world is a member, not only of nature, but also of history, which is a second cosmos different in structure and complexion, entirely neglected by metaphysics in favor of the first. I was originally brought to reflect on this fundamental question of our world consciousness through noticing how present-day historians, as they fumble round tangible events, things become, believe themselves to have already grasped history, the happening, the becoming itself. This is a prejudice common to all who proceed by reason and cognition, as against intuitive perception, and it had long ago been a source of perplexity to the great Eleatics with their doctrine that through cognition there could be no becoming, but only a being, or having become. In other words, history was seen as nature, in the objective sense of the physicist, and treated accordingly, and it is to this that we must ascribe the baneful mistake of applying the principles of causality, of law, of system, that is, the structure of rigid being to the picture of happenings. It was assumed that a human culture existed just as electricity or gravitation existed, and that it was capable of analysis in much the same way as these. The habits of the scientific researcher were eagerly taken as a model, and if, from time to time, some student asked what Gothic or Islam or the polis was, no one inquired why such symbols of something living inevitably appeared just then, and there, in that form and for that space of time. Historians were content, whenever they met one of the innumerable similarities between widely discrete historical phenomena, simply to register it, adding some clever remarks as to the marvel of coincidence, dubbing Rhodes the Venice of Antiquity, and Napoleon the modern Alexander, or the like. Yet it was just these cases in which the destiny problem came to the fore as the true problem of history, viz. the problem of time, that needed to be treated with all possible seriousness and scientifically regulated physiognomic, in order to find out what strangely constituted necessity, so completely alien to the causal, was at work. That every phenomenon ipso facto propounds a metaphysical riddle, that the time of its occurrence is never irrelevant, that it is still remained to be discovered what kind of living interdependence, apart from the inorganic natural law interdependence, subsists within the world picture, which radiates from nothing less than the whole man and not merely, as Kant thought, from the cognizing part of it. That a phenomenon was not only a fact for the understanding, but also an expression of the spiritual, not only an object but a symbol as well, be it one of the highest creations of religion or art or a mere trifle of everyday life, all this was, philosophically, something new. And thus, in the end, I came to see the solution clearly before me in immense outlines, possessed of full inward necessity, a solution derived from one single principle that, though discoverable, had never been discovered, that from my youth had haunted and attracted me, tormenting me with the sense that it was there and must be attacked and yet defying me to seize it. Thus, from an almost accidental occasion of beginning, there has arisen the present work, which is put forward as the provisional expression of a new world picture. The book is laden, as I know, with all the defects of a first attempt, incomplete, and certainly not free from inconsistencies. Nevertheless, I am convinced that it contains the incontrovertible formulation of an idea which, once enunciated clearly, will, I repeat, be accepted without dispute. If, then, the narrower theme is an analysis of the decline of that West European culture which is now spread over the entire globe, yet the object in view is the development of a philosophy and of the operative method peculiar to it, which is now to be tried, viz. the method of comparative morphology and world history, the work falls naturally into two parts. The first, form and actuality, starts from the form language of the great cultures, attempts to penetrate to the deepest roots of their origin, and so provides itself with the basis for a science of symbolic. The second part, world historical perspectives, starts from the facts of actual life, and from the historical practice of higher mankind seeks to obtain a quintessence of historical experience that we can set to work upon the formation of our own future. The accompanying tables present a general view of what has resulted from the investigation. They may at the same time give some notion both of the fruitfulness and of the scope of the new methods.